the approach for Housing First is get somebody housed as quickly as possible, wrap them with support services so that they can keep their housing and not return to homelessness. You get a person or a family who's experiencing homelessness into a home, normally an apartment, sometimes a house, depending on where in the country you are as to what's affordable. You get them in there as soon as possible and it is their home. It's not somewhere that they have to work a program to keep. It's not somewhere that they'll have to leave in six months. This is their home. And then you bring the support services to them. It's pretty much impossible for somebody to get clean and sober while they're on their streets. Um, I mean, if you think about it, you're fighting for your survival every single day. And so you're, you know, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you are meeting your basic needs. How am I going to eat? How am I going to stay safe? Where am I going to sleep? Not only is it cheaper, and I can share those statistics with you to house people, but people's behaviors change when they're housed. So people who are chronically homeless, so kind of the people with the most complex issues and the most complex needs, when they were housed, they had 68% less ambulance rides and 100% less arrests. So once people are housed, it really gives them that framework to be able to start to tackle some of those issues that it's really impossible for them to do while they're on the street. For our brothers and sisters who have disabilities, who've been homeless for a year or more, those who are chronically homeless, we found it was $100,000, over $100,000 per person per year to leave them on the streets. To place them into housing, permanent supportive housing, or supportive housing, costs us $51,000 per person per year. So not only, I would argue, it's the morally right thing to do to house people, um, it's also the more fiscally responsible thing to do with our tax dollars. I like the word profit with a PH, but I, you know, I'm also getting used to the word profit with an F, right? And, and understanding that it's inherently not a bad word. It depends where we put those profits, right? And so uh, I, everything that we do has this double bottom line, creates profits or surplus or income uh, to, to, uh, to go to fund something else, but it also does good, right? We're growing fresh fruits and vegetables and feeding families and we're meeting a need. We're creating, a, you know, with the preschool, we're bringing in income. Uh, there's profit or revenue or a surplus or re however you want to describe it. But uh, and at the same time, we're creating jobs through that. Uh, we're providing a great product for the parents and we're generating, you know, a little extra to do other stuff. Now that can be applied in all kinds of ways for churches. That can be applied to uh, what we do with our parish halls. It can be applied to what we do with our office space. It can be applied to what we do with our sanctuaries, our parking lots, our extra land, right? And really the only thing stopping us is kind of how creative we are. One of those ways that we can create a double bottom line, right, is to uh, bring, is to, is to bring to the table what something we have, land, right? We have land in our properties and can we uh, utilize that land uh, to create housing to meet another kind of another need right in the community whether it's for senior housing or for uh, you know chronic homelessness uh, you know supportive uh, kind of uh, long-term supportive housing or student housing those are real needs especially in Los Angeles those are desperate needs right now we could use these social enterprise opportunities as ways to develop relationships uh, whether it's college students or whether it's seniors or whether it's uh, people dealing with long-term homelessness there's ministry opportunities there. So any of us could be homeless. I mean, if I didn't have a paycheck for a couple of months, I'd start feeling it. Most of us would. We don't have like big savings accounts. And, and so I can imagine if, if somebody is living month to month and then one of the parents or both the parents of a family, for example, lose their job, well, within two months, they don't have a house to live in. So what we would like to produce would be housing for 30 to 50 people that would be funded through existing monies that come from the state and the federal government. Some may be under titles that would assist elderly people, low-income people. Some might assist people with children who are low-income. And some will assist people in addiction, people living on the street, the classic homeless people. So any, any of the churches, any of the clergy, or any of the lay people who are 
thinking about a project like this, you have it takes a long time to, to put it together. On the one hand, it's very taxing, frustrating, and time consuming. But on the other hand, we're really serving the people that I, I believe God's asked us to serve. And these are people disenfranchised from the mainstream of society through lack of housing, through lack of health, through lack of money, through lack of support. And many of these people, uh, when they tell you their stories, you'll know why we're here. Because through the grace of God, people who get involved in this community change their lives. We have had so much help from the diocese. We've had you know, architects who are Episcopalians, who are also world-class, who are doing work for us. We've had Mercy House on board. We've had a funding group that is very, very familiar with the various titles of state and federal money helping us. You, you must get to know the city. You, know, you have to know the stakeholders. You have to know the power brokers. And so you do have to know your city councilman. You do have to know your mayor. You have to know the people in code enforcement. You have to know the local police. They're all partners. And nobody's really against what you're doing, but we all have to work in concert because every one of those organizations has its own strategic plan that may or may not include housing. Lucky for us, the strategic planning for the city of Riverside does include planning for, ho for housing for people who need it. St. Michael's Episcopal Church in the city of Riverside has answered God's call in the book of Matthew to love our neighbors as ourselves. And they've taken a strong advocacy role for our neighbors without homes. As part of Riverside's Love Your Neighbor initiative, St. Michael's is partnering with Mercy House, one of Southern California's top providers of homeless solutions, to gain approval for a 50-unit housing complex on the St. Michael's campus. A critical component of our program will be appropriate and professionally managed wraparound services to ensure our neighbors without homes have ample support as they work to transform their lives. Another critical co component will be for our faith-based organizations working alongside those social workers to ensure that our neighbors without homes receive ample love from our faith community. There are beautiful things going on in Riverside and we are pleased to share this one component of our larger mission. I would like to thank the Episcopal Church and Reverend Dr. Mary Crest for their partnership on this initiative. We know that all things are possible through God, and I very much look forward to bringing this project to fruition. God bless. I'm a coordinator of the Homeless Shower Program at St. Luke's Long Beach. We've been um, serving the community homeless with showers and clothing for over 20 years. We probably serve twice what we did 10 years ago. We started this program years ago because our facility had two showers in a boys' restroom from a previous school that was on the premises, and we've grown from there. The best that we feel like we can do is to treat people with dignity and kindness and help them to be clean and um, get them clean clothes and, of course, feed their bodies, nourish their bodies. and. The people come out of the shower with clothes and they just feel like a different person than when they walked in. This is what, as Christians, we were called to do, and um, it's important work. Together, with God in the center, we can change this neighborhood. But I need you to help me do this. Whether it's the faith sector, or whether it's the non, you know, the nonprofit sector, or whether it's the government sector, or, or private enterprise, or you know, we all need to have skin in the game. We need to advocate to bring more housing solutions online. We need to use the resources we have, if we can, that already exist to get more housing online, and then providing community once people are housed. We have to keep on keeping on because if the stakes are too high, that if people see somebody like me or yourselves try and we don't move the ball to ending it, they will say, let's not touch that issue. Let's not do that. Homelessness is something to manage, not to actually win. And I believe we can, we must.